In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So you have probably somewhere along the way heard the phrase, context is everything. When I was a freshman in college, I took a sociology class, and he gave us that phrase, context is everything. It was a summer course, so we talked about how all of us were going to beach to the beach that summer. We would all be wearing our swimsuits in public, and nobody would think anything of it. And at the end of that lecture, he said, now, I suggest that tomorrow you wear your swimsuit to work. <laughs> that was our reaction. We knew immediately it was a ridiculous suggestion, because the context was different. But I have thought about that a lot. I've thought about why, um, when you see someone walking down the street and what approximates their swimsuit, you have a reaction that's, you know, like, who would do that? But we do the exact same thing in a state park or a lake, and we don't think anything of it. The phrase context is everything is also true when you're studying scripture, whether it's uh, in school, like some of us have done, but also in church on Sunday morning. The basic principle is if you want to understand a passage and what it's saying to you, you need to know the context. You need to know if you're at the beach or at work, so to speak, with the passage that you're in. This summer, we have been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew, and both Father Bill and Deacon Tex um, preached on Matthew the last two weeks, and I'll be drawing on their sermons too, but Matthew is a very rich book, and it has a lot of different layers to it. And so to understand uh, any passage in Matthew, you really need to know its context. You need to know what went before, what went after, and that helps you understand the passage you're looking at. So this morning, we're going to do two things. First, we're going to look at the structure of chapter 13, meaning what's its context? What's going on here? Because it starts out by saying, Jesus left the house. So where was Jesus before, and why would Jesus leave the house? And we're, get, we're going to consider what that actual context and structure means for us and for our lives. And then we're going to dive into the parable, which I think is a fairly familiar parable for a lot of us. So Matthew, in the context of the Gospels, is obviously one of four. And if you've never thought about why we have four, it's because each of them emphasize different things. So Matthew's concern in his gospel is, he is he's writing to the Jewish people specifically, and he wants to show that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies, and that he is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. So he is the gospel that quotes the Old Testament the most, and we actually have an Old Testament quote in chapter 13, which uh, we didn't hear read out loud, because the part you heard read out loud is the first 10 verses, and then verses um, 18 through 20, but there's a chunk right in the middle there that quotes the Old Testament. And because Matthew is interested in making an argument for Jesus, he is the gospel that uh, records most of Jesus' teachings. So if you read Mark, Mark is all action. Mark is Jesus did this, and Jesus did this, and Jesus did this. And if you read Luke, Luke is a doctor, and Luke will go on and on about the healings of Jesus, which Luke is my personal favorite gospel for that reason. I love the topic of healing. But Matthew is specifically concerned with passing on the teachings of Jesus. We know that um, Matthew was pretty highly educated. He was a tax collector, and so to be a tax collector, you had to be able to count and record and things like that. And so Matthew's gospel is actually very organized. If you read it straight through, you'll find he's organized his book around seven mountains. And I'm guessing most of you know the first mountain. It's the most familiar one. The Sermon on the Mount was on a mountain. And in between the seven mountains where things happen, where we have narrative, he has five teaching sets, what we call the discourses. And chapter 13 is actually the very beginning of the third discourse or the third teaching set. So we, if you kind of think of it as a mountain, we are right smack dab in the middle of Matthew with some very important teachings. And that tells us to pay attention to what's going on here. At the beginning of chapter 13, 
we, we have this uh, transitional phrase, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered around him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. Now, for those of us who are familiar with the Gospels and have been in church a while and have heard a lot of readings, that might not strike us as anything particularly unusual. But in the Gospel of Matthew, this is the first time parables have been mentioned. So this section, chapter 13, marks a change. Up until now, Jesus has been teaching in a fairly straightforward way. The Sermon on the Mount, if you read it, you know, is pretty clear. Don't divorce. Don't uh, hate people. Don't uh, be angry. Don't, you know, it's, it's not obscure. But in chapter 13, all of a sudden we have the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like a sower. The kingdom of God is like weeds. The kingdom of God is like pearls. And in the actual language of Matthew, this is the first time the word parable is used. This is a collection. Jesus didn't sit down one day and give all of these at the same time. But the message of this collection is all about the kingdom of heaven. What is it like to live in the place where God dwells? So the immediate question is, why? You know, why would we all of a sudden, in the middle of the gospel, when he's been speaking plainly, would Jesus start talking in riddles? What's the point of that? And that takes us back to context. In the chapters leading up to this, um, to this one, what we've started noticing is times where Jesus is opposed, and he's opposed by different groups. He's opposed by the Pharisees. He's opposed by the crowds. He sends his disciples out to experiment with teaching, and they are opposed. And right before our chapter starts, in chapter 12, verses 46, Jesus is actually opposed by his family. It says, while he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mothers and brothers stood outside asking to speak with him. So he's in the house. They're outside. And this is um, where Jesus replies, who are my mother and brother? Here are my disciples. And I think Father Bill did a nice job two weeks ago talking about what that means in terms of it's not that we don't care about family, but Jesus is prioritizing something above natural family. So after all of these oppositions, scribes, crowds, uh, his family, all of a sudden Jesus begins to speak in parables. There's a, an analogy here that's not unlike social media. Um, if you think of the crowds in Matthew 13 as sort of the general public of our day, and you post something on Facebook or, or Instagram, you have people that come and check it out just because they're curious, right? They just want to know what's going on. But also, you have the trolls. And trolls are attracted to whoever is the most interesting person of the day. Jesus was the most interesting person of the day. You have people coming from all over. He's the guy standing in a boat in a lake talking, and there's everyone coming to listen to him. So the parables are one of the ways in which Jesus deals with the trolls. The parables have a function of getting the message out to those whose hearts are open, but veiling it in such a way that people who are looking to criticize him, or literally looking to kill him, can't immediately say, look at that specific thing he said. Instead, they have to go, weeds, seed. What, what did he mean by that? Did he mean what I think he meant, or did he mean something else? So there's a veiling that happens in the, these, um, these sections. One of the other transitions we see in chapter 13 is Jesus begins to separate out what he does for his followers that's different from what he does to just the curiosity onlookers. So in the part that we didn't read out loud, the, that middle section between verse 10 and 18, the disciples come to Jesus and they ask, why are you suddenly speaking in parables? And Jesus gives them an answer. He says, to you, my disciples, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom. But to them, meaning the crowds, it has not been given. And this is the first time in this gospel we see a distinction between Jesus' willingness to be very plain with the people who've already made a commitment to him, but more veiled about people who might have other agendas 
And that is why he then goes on in the, the part we did here, starting in verse 18, where he's like, here's what that story about the sower meant. So this is our first point for us today. There is a distinction in following Jesus between being a hearer and being a follower. A lot of people hear. The commitment to follow is a different thing. Many followed. Huge crowds followed. The scribes and Pharisees followed. People from foreign countries followed. But that's different from actually trying to live out the gospel. And Jesus, in the parable of the sower, is going to flesh that out and, and really ask the implied question, which are you? Where are you? And I would suggest that for each of us, this is perhaps the most important question of our life. Are we hearers or are we followers? You can be a hearer and not actually have faith in the Lord. A follower is someone who's taken that hearing and, and uh, made a commitment in response to it. So with that question in our hearts, are you a hearer or a follower, let's look at the parable itself. Now, the nice thing about this parable, unlike some of the others, is we don't actually have to guess about what it means. <laughs> a lot of times I read the parables and I go, I, I don't quite, I could give four different interpretations. The one about the virgins and the lambs, I'm still not sure about that one. <laughs> but this one, we have it all laid out. And if you'll see, it's because they went back into the house and he spoke to his disciples privately. So in this parable of the sower, the seed is the word of God. It is something living and active that gives life. And if you think for a minute, what is the message of this seed that the sower is scattering everywhere that some people get a great return on and some people don't? I would su suggest to you for today in this context that the seed is Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, you who have no money. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food here that your soul may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The Gospel of Matthew is in continuity with the great promises of the Old Testament. And the passage of scripture that is quoted in 13 that we didn't hear is actually from Isaiah, talking about this invitation in the form of a seed to come to the Lord, to come to his Messiah, and at least in this context, the fact that some people will say yes to that and some people will say no to that. So this seed of come, you are welcome, is going out everywhere. And as we know, we've got four different kinds of soil. Some of the soil receives it, takes it in. Some of the soil doesn't even do that. You know, sometimes it sits on the surface and goes away immediately. Some it gets a little bit in there and then withers. Some of it goes deep and you have different harvests. And Jesus is saying that always, in response to his message, there are a variety of responses. Now, this is important in the life of the disciples, because if you, um, if you look at, in the earlier parts, they had all these early victories. They were seeing people healed. They were seeing miracles. It was, it was exciting. It was, I mean, I've never seen anybody raised from the dead. That'd be exciting. <laughs> And all of a sudden, there starts to be this other voice against that, saying, that's demonic, or that's not real, or, you know, this guy isn't good. And if you're following Jesus, and you're now being sent out to do the same things he did, and you're getting this variety of responses back, you need to have a sense of, am I doing something wrong? Is this normal? If this is a good thing, why doesn't everybody see and acknowledge that? So Jesus has a dual purpose. For the crowds, he's saying, the word goes forth. There are different responses. Some of you will receive it. Some of you won't. And to his disciple, he's, he's saying, it will be the case until the end of time, although we don't know that in this passage, but we know it in others, until Jesus comes back, the word will go forth, and some will say yes, and some will say no, 
and some will say, I need to hear more about this matter. That's from Acts 17, if you're wondering where that phrase comes from. So the first three soils, we might say, are hearers. They receive it. They maybe take it in. Nothing really happens with it. The fourth soil are the followers, where the seed sinks in and changes something. And it doesn't change the same thing for everybody. You know, sometimes there's a 30% harvest, a 60%, 100%. I wouldn't get hung up on the numbers. The important part is verse um, 23. The one who hears the word and understands it, takes it in, bears fruit and yields. Yields something good out of it. So we're back to that question of are we hearers and followers? And there are two things, two other things I want us to take from the parable today. The first is that as followers of Christ, we follow Jesus' example. Jesus, in this parable, is to sow. We are to sow. We are to pass out the word of life every opportunity we get. Sometimes those are big opportunities. Sometimes they're very small. Sometimes you get to sit down and explain the whole gospel to someone. Sometimes it's just a moment or a phrase. But all of that is taking the good word and the invitation of come to me, all ye who labor and are heavenly laden, and I will give you rest, and share that as much as we can. Last week, Deacon Tex talked about us being yoked with Christ and that the goal of our lives is becoming like Christ. And this is one way in which we are like Christ, is in sowing the seed. Michael Niebauer, who is, um, he is, he's an Anglican priest, I know, but he's also a missionary. And he said, bearing witness to Christ is not separate or an additional activity for the Christian, but it is intrinsically part of our existence. Those of us who are followers of Christ, it is in our nature to share the word wherever we can. Jesus sows, we sow. And here's a point that I think is interesting to observe. We don't check out the soil first. We don't wait until we're sure that the the soil is good. Now, there are other places in Scripture that talk about cultivating things, so I'm not denying that. But this passage today starts with, You just throw it out there, and it's up to the soil and God to figure out what's going to grow. And Paul says something similar where he says, you know, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God makes it grow. So that's the first thing. We follow Jesus' example, and we sow. The second thing is that people can say no. As I've already said, there are those who accept and those who don't. Jesus' main point in this chapter is that As opposition grows, you will will see people's reactions getting stronger. And um, like, once you realize there's power in that word, you can't stay neutral about it. You have to have some sort of reaction to it. And our job is not to sort out the reaction. Uh, I think for me, growing up in church, sometimes there was... There was this focus on, if someone didn't receive it, I had done something wrong. I had not been winsome. Winsome was a word we used in my college fellowship a lot. Like, if you're winsome, people will receive the gospel. And Jesus is saying, maybe, maybe not. We see throughout scripture that sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. There is a great book called Christianity Rediscovered. If you've never read it, I would recommend it to to all of you. It's the story of a man who was a missionary to Africa, and um, he, he went to the Maasai tribes, which at the time were a set of tribes that had not yet been fully reached with the gospel. This was probably 70s or 80s, a while ago now. And there were many schools that had been built by Catholic priests in the area, so there was a Christian presence, but he wasn't sure if these tribes had actually had the gospel the gospel message told to them. So he went with some other missionaries as a team, and they traveled to each tribe and said, can we, we're not sure if you've heard the story, can we lay out the gospel message that there's a God who loves you, that things are broken in the world, that he sent Jesus to accomplish salvation, and that you can be saved. So when he met with the tribes, he had this experience over and over again, two reactions. 
One of them was that many of the tribes said to him, you've been in our region for about 25 years. You've built schools for us. You've built hospitals for us. But why haven't you ever told us this? If you're saying our salvation is dependent on responding to the message of Jesus to take his work in our lives, if our salvation is dependent on that, why didn't you tell us that before now? And um, the author of this book really reflects on his approach of, well, we need to be friends, or we need, you know, I need to be cautious. And he was very challenged by that response from people who had never heard the good news before. The second thing that that book talks about is the tribes then said, OK, we've heard you. We are now going to go away and take counsel, and we will decide whether we're going to follow Jesus or not, and we're going to let you know. And he said the first time that happened, he was sort of shocked. Like, can people do that? Can they just go away and take counsel and come back and say no thanks? <laughs> and throughout the rest of the book, that's exactly what happens. You see, I think he visited probably um, 11 or 12 tribes over the years he was there. Sometimes they came back and said, yes, we want to know more, or yes, we receive him. And sometimes they said, no, thank you. That's nice, but we'll go on with our lives. And the impact of what that was for him, of watching someone choose not to follow Jesus and the real implication that that has. So I think this passage has a bit of a challenge, but it also has a comfort. And uh, my prayer for us this morning is that we would, we would settle it for ourselves first. Are we hearers or are we followers? There are times and seasons to be in both places. If the story's new for you, being a hearer for a season makes a lot of sense. If it's a story you've been hearing for a while and there hasn't been a transition to follower, to follower, then the question is, what needs to happen to make that happen? Or what choice are you weighing? So that's the first thing. Get the answer to that first. <laughs> but for those of us that are already in the follower category, to pray for opportunities to sow. Pray for opportunities to plant the good seed. And also know that if you receive opposition or even ambivalence, that Jesus tells us that's going to happen. Doesn't necessarily mean you did something wrong. Be winsome if you can be winsome. But <laughs> even if you aren't, at the end of the day, what goes on in people's hearts is between them and the Lord. So I'm going to pray for us um, about these things. I'm so grateful, Lord, that you have left us a record of how you taught your disciples and the example that it is a journey where we grow in these truths and that there are times we need to ask questions. So we thank you that in the parable of the sower, you are allowing us to grow in the grace of sowing the word into other people's lives. I pray that we would not be afraid. I pray that we would remember we are yoked to you and um, just follow your example. And I pray for opportunities to have spiritual conversations, just answer brief questions, or just, just opportunities, Lord, to sow seed this week. And we trust you with the outcomes. I do pray for those in Athens who don't know you, that you would bring many to yourself, and that they would be able to share in our joy. In your name we pray. Amen.